Hello everyone. I'd like to wish you every blessing in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and risen Saviour. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law. We're actually going to be looking at Mark's Gospel over the next weeks, but um, before we do that, I'd like to begin by looking at the period that starts at the end of the Old Testament and, it, and goes on to the beginning of the New Testament. It's a period of about 400 years when seemingly God was silent, there was no prophetic voice. It's sometimes called the intertestament, intertestamental period, but if we consider that there was no prophetic voice, surely God was still active in that period. Surely God was waiting to fulfill his purpose which is what Galatians tells us. If we want to understand the, the end of the Old Testament we need to be looking at the historical books of Ezra and Nehemiah and also the prophetic books of Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. If we do that we'll find that one, the Jews return in, in substantial numbers from exile in Babylon. They've been in exile for some 70 years. Two, a guy called Zerubbabel is commissioned by God to rebuild the temple that had been left in ruins as the Babylonians sacked the city all those years before. Three, a guy called Ezra who was a priest and a scribe, an expert in the law, a teacher of the law the Bible tells us. And Ezra restored proper worship of God and it's called people back to obedience of, of the law that perhaps had been lost during those years in exile. And we meet a guy called Nehemiah who rebuilds the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So we find that the Jews are back in Judea. However, they are still under Persian rule and that Persian rule would last for a further 100 years. The Persians though, were, were largely tolerant of Jewish worship and practice so this was a fairly benign period in Israel's history. And in that period we find that the synagogues emerge where um, synagogues, in, in contrast to the temple, the temple was based in Jerusalem, but the synagogues were in the locality, and that's where um, the, the, the people would go to worship in a local basis. And also we, we find significant development of what's known as the, the oral law. Now the oral law was kind of interpretation, or further interpretation even, of the written law that had already been given. The, the, there was many laws that supplemented and, and brought to, to today's practice or to the, the day then the practice of, of the law in, in everyday situations and of course such um, additional laws and interpretation of laws and supplementary laws needed so-called experts who would teach the people the law and explain it to them and, and devise new laws that um, allowed correct following of the Torah and the, the written law. And of course it's these experts that we find in the New Testament Jesus clashed with on many occasions because he, he, he accused them of being hypocrites. He said, you're putting too much burden on the people. You're allowing tradition to supplement, and to, well, to overrule really the true purpose of the law of God. Basically, they got it wrong in those New Testament times. In 331 BC, a guy called Alexander the Great, who you might remember from your school days or from your history books, conquered Judea. Alexander was, uh, had united the Greek states and was on his quest to overthrow the Persian Empire, which he did successfully. And quite a lot of the Middle East beca became under the influence of, of Greece. And Alexander even went as far as, as India. And that didn't exclude Israel, which, as I say, came under Greek rule in 331 BC. Now, Greek culture was attractive. They found that there was improved stand living standards, good administration, there was gr good communication networks, progressive education systems. And this attractive culture began to influence Judaism. Uh, this is called Hellenization is a term that we use for the influence of Greek culture. However, this Greek culture was ungodly and tensions arose. There's an element of tension between Hellenistic influence and Jewish traditions. Some of the Jews were accepting of the Hellenistic traditions um, 
some some resisted and wanted to stick fastly to the Jewish traditions. These kind of Jews were called the faithful ones or the Hasidism. Alexander, as you perhaps know though, his, his reign was short-lived. He died in the year 323 BC at the tender age of 32. But of course Greek culture would live on for centuries, well into the Roman era and perhaps even today we still feel its influence in our Western society. After Alexander's death, Israel became subject to Egyptian rule um, for about a period of 120 years. Now this wasn't the Egypt of the pharaohs that we read about in Moses. Again, this is essentially a Greek empire. What happened was that Alexander divided his empire up between his four generals. One of these generals was called Ptolemy and he based his empire for, in Egypt. Um, so we have the Ptolemaic kingdom or the Ptolemaic empire. But largely this was a continuation of the previous benign period of the Persians. Uh, a period of relative peace and pro prosperity for the Israelites. So we've, we've had, since the return from exile, we've just covered about 200 years, not bad in five minutes, eh, of um, relative peace and freedom for Israel, albeit under foreign rule. In 198 BC, Egyptian rule was ended by uh, another empire called the Seleucid Empire. Now, again, this was largely Greek in, in nature, and per perhaps even more so than the Egyptian um, Empire. Uh, Seleucus was another of, of Alexander's gen generals who inherited or acquired a portion of the, the Greek Empire that he created. However, the Seleucids were much less tolerant of Israeli practice. Seleuc the Seleucids wanted uh, uh, an homogenization, a, a common Greek culture throughout throughout the empire. And then in 175 BC, a guy called Antiochus IV, or Antiochus Epiphanes, he took control of the Seleucid Empire. And he was really hostile, and really oppressive towards the Jews in that time. He promoted Hellenization, as I say, he wanted Hellenization to be the, the go-to culture, the go-to worship practice, the go-to religion of, of, um, of his empire and that included those in Israel. Consequently, Jewish practice, Jewish worship, Jewish customs all became illegal. Antiochus forbade them and insisted that um, the Jews step in line. Antiochus declared himself to be God allegedly in his oppression of the Jews. He killed 40,000 of them in one day and uh, in what often Jews refer to as the abomination of desolation that we, we read about in Daniel. Um, Antiochus set up a, a pagan altar in the temple and was to slaughter swine on it. Of course, the, the resistance to this type of um, oppression grew and um, in 167 BC, a priest named Mattathias, who had five sons, set up a re revolt. And he and his five sons, Mattathias had, had killed a, a Seleucid officer and a, a Jewish priest who had been forced to, to make a, a false offering, a, a pagan offering, before in, in the temple. And um, then they, they, they fled to the hills with his sons and set up a guerrilla army. These would become known as the Maccabees, which is Greek for hammer. Matthias' son uh, succeeded, was called Judas, and he succeeded Matthias, and he waged this guerrilla campaign, and eventually he was to reclaim the temple precincts, and he purified the sanctuary, purified the temple, and reclaimed the area back for the Lord. The Jews, of course, recognised this as their festival, their winter festival, Anukah. You might have heard of it. I know the schools do much more about this than certainly in my day, uh, the Festival of Lights. Uh, this this guerrilla campaign was to continue for uh, quite some time, for perhaps about 20 or so years, and by 142 BC, all Syrian presence was removed from Judea. This began a, perhaps what's seen as a golden era of Jewish independence, one that would not be seen again until recent times, really, in 1948, when Israel became a nation-state again. <coughs> 
This independent era was ruled by a dynasty of priest kings called the Hasmoneans. And the kings became priests also. They assumed the role of priests. However, as, as is often in renewal and reform movements, sadly, um, Maccabean ideals were compromised over time and eventually abandoned. In that period, um, some interesting groups arose. First of all, the Sadducees, who were identified with the Hasmoneans um, and were centred around the temple and the priest, priestly office, they, they kind of emerged. And also it's thought that the Pharisees emerged during this period, calling back the people, back to faithfulness to the law. So as ideals were compromised, the Pharisees were, who kind of inherited the, the faithful ones tag, the Hasidism, called, uh, arose, a group called the Pharisees arose and called the people back to faithfulness to God's holy law. This Maccabean era ended in um, 63 BC when Pompey, the Roman emperor of the time, Rome had obviously been getting stronger and stronger during this period, and Pompey invaded Jerusalem, and we, read that, we know that he profaned the temple, he entered the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest was allowed to do, and that was once a year, and he, he, he completed and overran this era of Jewish independence. The, the Romans set up um, initially a client king, or a puppet king if you like. This puppet king was called Antipater, who ruled for about 20 years. Antipater gained favour with Julius Caesar and was able to gain some, gain some religious freedom for Judaism uh, in a term that was called religio licita, or if you like, licensed religion. And this allowed the Jews to, to worship largely in their own way and allowed them to to disregard some of the practices of emperor worship and um, Roman worship that were prevalent at the time. Then after Antipater, 37 BC, a guy we, we know from our scriptures, Herod, King Herod, Herod the Great as he, as he was known as, he became king, but again still under Roman rule. And Herod the Great reigned until 4 BC, so he had a reign of circa 34 years. Herod was known for his magnificent building projects. He built um, the temple, including a greater temple. He expanded and built a greater temple in, in Jerusalem. It was a magnificent building, as we can read in our, in our scriptures. One interesting thing about Herod is that um, his later years were marked by a kind of paranoia regarding potential coups and threats to his realm, so much so um, that he, he thought everybody was plotting against him. And at one point he killed his favorite wife and two of his sons because he thought his kingdom was under threat. And that, that perhaps gives us some indication of uh, the state of mind of Herod, so that when we read in Luke's gospel that some um, wise men came from the east and began to inquire, where is he that is born king of the Jews? He was Herod with an amount of paranoia. King of the Jews? That's me. Who is this person? I want to um, protect my dynasty. I want to protect my rule. And so he slaughtered, as we know, um, the children under two. Um, we, we read in our accounts of the, the gospel birth stories that when, when Jesus and Joseph and Mary returned from Egypt, they'd heard that Herod died. And this was Herod the Great who had died. Um, and Herod didn't have one successor, he named three. And there was three Herods. Um, the one was called Archelaus. He took Judea and Samaria, so that's in the south. Um, Archelaus would later be removed because he was cruel to the Jews and the Jews complained bitterly about him to Rome. By this time, um, during the Roman era, the role of priest and king had been separated again. So the Romans also appointed a separate priest. So there was some independent influence from the priest apart from the king. And the Jews complained about Archelaus, complained bitterly and Rome removed him. And Instead of replacing him with a king, they put in a, government, a governor or a procurator. And the most famous of these, of course, was um, Pontius Pilate. 
Perhaps that also gives us insight to Pontius Pilate's state of mind, having known that uh, kings and rulers could be removed by Rome if they didn't keep the locals happy and didn't find, tread a fine line between Rome and the Jews, then they could easily be dispatched. And of course, Pilate succumbed to the wishes of the Jews when they wanted to crucify Jesus, partly because of fear for his own position. The other um, Herods that were around after Herod the Great, one was called Antipas. Uh, he took Galilee, Galilee sorry, and a place called Perea. Um, Antipas, of course, is the, the Herod that was to kill John the Baptist and take off his head. And the other Herod is Philip, whose wife went and married or went and lived with Herod Antipas. Um, and Philip was ruler in the provinces to the north and east of Galilee. So that brings us right into the New Testament era into which Jesus was born, into which Jesus came and God sent his son into the world to redeem his people. I would also like to touch briefly on the religious situation at the time when Jesus came to this earth. First of all, looking at the non-Jewish religions that were around. First of all, there was, um, of course, traditional mythology of the Greeks and the Romans that had um, survived into this time, but albeit was, was in decline. So you think of the traditional Greek gods like Zeus and the Roman gods, which were similar, but with different names, Neptune for one. There was also significant influence from the Roman Empire, from the, East, the Eastern mythological traditions and the cults that came from, from the East. Um, often these involved blood initiation rites, secret blood initiation rites, sacramental meals, often sexual excess, sometimes these were popular within the military environment. Uh, we were also aware of Greek philosophies that were around at the time. Of course there were various schools of Greek philosophy. Uh, to name a few, we had Platonism, Cynics, Skeptics, Epicureans, Stoics and Pythagoreans. <coughs> Paul of course addressed some of these in Acts. And we, we know some of these words even to this day. Um, words like cynic and skeptic uh, perhaps explains something of the meaning of those philosophies but not all encompassing and then there was the cult of the emperor emperor worship the the roman caesars were divine initially they were divinized on the on the death but it became more popular in later times that a living roman empire would be declared a god of course we're probably more interested in Judaism for our purpose and the Judaism, the, the environment within Judaism at the time and like Christianity today really Judaism wasn't homogenous we have different expressions of Christianity today and there were different expressions of Judaism in Jesus time we can look at four groups first of all we've already mentioned the Pharisees the Pharisees were popular they were centered around the synagogue, the, the, the teachers and the, 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 the weekly routine, the, the daily routine of, of worship called people to obedience of the law, both written and oral. And these were always bad, we, we, we perhaps have a, they get a bad press, but they weren't always bad. It's probable that Jesus is closer to the Pharisees than to any other group of the time. But we have to recognise that Jesus, of course, accused them on a regular basis of hypocrisy. And legalism. And another group we've also mentioned were the Sadducees. These were an aristocratic, sorry, aristocratic uh, priestly family group that centered around, uh, centered around the temple and its practices um, and the, the worship and the sacrifice that was around the temple. These were more accepting of the Romans, but um, with, they had become more corrupt, become corrupt, use their position to gain wealth. And influence and we see a hint of that in the, the New Testament where Jesus overturned the money changes at the temple uh, um, that was being used for, for money and greed rather than the true worship of God. The, the Sadducees rejected the oral law. They did accept all of God's words, all of God's word, but only the Pentateuch was binding. And of course, as, as we famously know that because there's no resurrection mentioned in the Pentateuch, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection of the body, which the Pharisees did. There was a group called the Zealots. These were revolutionaries who wanted to evict Rome through violence. 
Jesus had a disciple who was a zealot, Simon the zealot we read, and these wanted to use force to bring about the restoration of God's kingdom, God's Israelite kingdom. And then we know of another group, the Essenes, these were a monastic group who withdrew from society and they were preparing for a messianic figure who was to come from within their ranks. Um, the Essenes we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, a large quantity of literature, ancient literature was found in some Essene retreats um, containing many important scrolls and some not so important. If we look at the Judaism of the time, we can perhaps briefly pick out some characteristics of that Judaism. There was a great interest in angels, or a greater interest in angels and the demonic. And it's quite interesting if we think of the Old Testament where there's a little bit of mentions of the, the spirit world and the non-physical world. In the New Testament we, we read Jesus encountering demons and unclean spirits quite a lot. So something different had happened and we're not really given... Um, insight into that situation but certainly by the time of Jesus there was more interest in angels and uh, the demonic forces that surround this world. There was an increase in ap apocalyptic themes um, so there was a, a, a sense that God was about to do something new that something different was, was about to happen. The, the, the Sanhedrin had increasing influence and increasing power centred around this magnificent new temple that had been built. They had influence among the people and, in, and the Romans certainly in the Jerusalem area. And if we think about um, Jewish life, what made a good Jew? Badges of Judaism if you like. Well, a good Jew kept the dietary laws. A good Jew kept the Sabbath. And of course Jews were circumcised. So the, the badges of Judaism were, were, were kind of the, the dietary laws, Sabbath keeping and circumcision. And of course Jesus challenged uh, two of these when, in his discussions with the scribes and the Pharisees and, and Paul went further. He challenged all three of them including circumcision and saying that actually in the new kingdom circumcision is of no value. It's our faith in Christ that matters. And then, there, of course, Judaism was a very nationalistic religion. They, they, they were resistant, on the whole, to Roman um, power. And they believed in the promises of God that was going to restore them and, and create a great nation. That promises to Abraham, the promises to David, that they, they would have a kingdom that, that would last forever. So, um, And they censored their nationalistic belief, their nationalistic further around the temple around the Torah, around the land, and maybe it's still so today. So in summary, just to look at back over this intertestamental period, these 400 or so years that we've very briefly covered, and then next week we're going to go into the Gospel of Mark proper and look at the New Testament into which Jesus came and the life of Jesus and of course his death and resurrection. So just to summarise, we covered a period, of most of which was under foreign Gentile rule. Sometimes this rule was tolerant, other times it was oppressive and hostile against the Jews. We have, going back a hundred or so years, a golden period of independence that was relatively fresh in the memory. And, and Jews look forward to, to that being restored in, in even greater measure in the coming years, in accordance with the promises of God as they saw them. We see that there was a newly refurbished and a new magnificent temple in Jerusalem ran by a priestly sect. And you can just imagine, can't you, the, the people with this fresh memory of independence, um, this magnificent new temple in, in Jerusalem that was on the verge of being completed. How, how exciting for them. They could see um, perhaps a new era dawning when God was going to restore his his kingdom for Israel and God was going to restore Israel to the glories of former days. And of course we have to understand that uh, the Roman occupation had allowed Judaism some, f some freedom. There was still this situation of, of a licensed religion. So they were free to worship to a certain extent and avoid some of the excesses of Roman worship. And this 
we, we read helps, um, or we know, helps Christianity in its early days to a certain extent because Christianity was seen by the Romans just to be another Jewish sect. So it fell under Ju the Judaism, religio licita, or the licensed religion. So religion was free to a certain extent to, to grow um, in the early days without too much Roman interference. Although we do read, of course, of oppression and persecution, but some, some of that was from Jewish sources and some of that was from, from Rome, perhaps they'd done by Jewish sources. Um, and then we can say that they had a, a there was a fractured Judaism. Um, it wasn't homogenous. There was different groups. There were some groups focusing on obedience to the law, some focusing on the temple cult, some on violent resistance to Rome, some on withdrawal. And then Jesus comes. Jesus comes amid all this hodgepodge of of religion, this fractured Judaism, and declares his new kingdom. And we'll, next week we'll talk about Mark. And Mark chapter 1 says, The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Thank you and God bless.